You got a minute? You must be part of my hangover. And I hope the wax in your ears didn't stop you from hearing, pal. I'll remember your face. I'll try to forget yours. What about the bartender? I let him have it over the head with a peanut machine. Run along, darling, before I fracture your spine. Is that gun loaded? You want to find out? No, I'm happy at just guessing. You don't have to say anything and you don't have to do anything. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. If you're the police, where are your badges? I don't have to show you any stinking bushes. I don't want to tell you That's a- what I've been doing when I've not been writing Haunted Hollywoods because you're going to um, be mad at me. You're going to be disappointed. Have you been watching, like, you know, 902 an hour or something? No, I was watching Painkiller and then I'm terrified of doctors now. <laughs> um, I, I've been on Timu trying to win a free gift with fish for about a week and I, I've finally come into the realisation that I don't think that I'm going to get the free gift by feeding the fish because you can't feed the fish enough. They're like super fish. Uh, I'm completely lost on what's happening here. What, you're on what yeah. and doing what for what? <laughs> that stupid Timu app. It got me. It got me. Timu app? I don't know what this is. Timu. Explain. Yeah, I don't know. The Explain. one that everybody thinks is a con. As it's got stuff on there for like... 10p. Uh, I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, maybe I can send you an invite then, and maybe I can feed my fish because you'll be a new user. <laughs> well, well, explain it to me. What is what is the deal? What do you have? What? It's it's like warehouse Amazon. So the stuff that you'd get on Amazon, you can mm. get on there for like half price. Sometimes one third price is ridiculous. Okay, but you have to feed fish? No, that's an extra part of it. Once they've hooked you, they say, oh, you can win free gifts and free this that's in your basket if you like complete this game. So I thought I'd really like that because that's already in my basket. So then I was get, I was on the games. It's all in the same app. So I'm on the games and then it shows you another game and now I'm playing like five games for a pair of curtains that cost like three pounds. <laughs> I should have just bought the fucking curtains for three pounds, to be honest, because the electric that I've wasted charging my phone to feed my fish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so is it legitimate? Have you bought anything from? Yeah, oh, so I Lily. So this is Lily's fault, right? She's been on and on and on prattling about for ages, and I eventually give in and downloaded it and thought, well, we'll have a look because I'm pretty sure it's a con. Uh-huh. And I ordered something. I thought I'll use like something secure, like PayPal or something like that, and I'll risk for like it. Let me do like a three pound order. So I thought I'll risk it three pound just to shut her up sure. because I was really looking forward to the fact that it would be a con. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, screw you, child. I'm going to prove yeah. you wrong. <laughs> yeah, but it totally backfired because the stuff turned up and it was really, really cool. And then I went back on them and bought more bastard stuff for the garden. And that came and that was really cool. And everything works. And it's too cheap. And now I'm feeding fish that aren't real. <laughs> and some crop that you can't eat. Wonder what they get out of the fish feeding thing. I have no idea, but I'm getting nothing out of it. I'm not getting my curtains. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I've been on like 95% for four days. <laughs> That is funny. So you go on, on it every day and you get like rewards and then it gives you like fish food. That's crazy weird. Is there anything else that you do on it? Like besides yeah, just feed fish or an, an order store. There's this whole evil section as well where you have to bring other other people into this addiction as well. So it's like, oh, if you get people to download it, you can get three pounds to your PayPal and five pounds to your PayPal. And I'm like I don't really want to bring anybody else into this. I don't want anybody else to up at two o'clock in the morning feeding invisible fish. (laughs) (laughs) What is it? In 10 years time, I'll be a shell of myself rocking back and forward, still trying to get these fucking curtains on 95% fed. So, so what's keeping you from actually feeding the, like, what's the deal? Like how? Oh, you only get so many, like you only get so much fish food a day. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And so, so you use that up and then what? So, so it's like, it's rigged. So it's rigged. So you can't, you can never win it or what? I don't, I don't know. I'm still finding out. I've got 25 more. I'll tell you in 25 days, I've got 25 days to fully <laughs> feed the fish. So in 25 days, if I'm ratting and raving, it hasn't gone well. And it's a total fix. I see. Oh, or so I, I might think be they're... really happy because I've got my curtains for free and probably have to pay £27 pound delivery charge. But there we go. I need and to ha- know. I need to get to the end of it now. It's got me. I have to know <laughs> if, it's a fix, if it's a fix or not. So, so, so uh, how long does it take you to feed the fish, fish each day? Like, like it's a- um, well, I've been, to, to be fair, I've been working the past couple of days. So I have been doing it when I was supposed to be at work. So maybe, maybe 20 minutes to feed the fish because you get rewards and then you have to click on it, but then it's dead slow. Oh. So it sounds like they're doing some sort of like audience retention or customer retention, keeping you on the thing. Maybe you, they're hoping you buy mm-hmm. more. I don't know what. That's really strange. But yeah. it's funny to hear about this. I'm going to have to check it out. And um, I don't know. It's So you've spent the money. You've received product. It's in good condition. It's real. Mm-hmm. You're happy with it. And it wasn't really that inexpensive. Yeah. It was ridiculous. I got wow. um Give me an example, yeah. Loads of, so I got loads of, so we're trying to do the garden up, but because it's a, a rented house, we don't it's gonna cost a lot of money to do the garden properly and it sounds awful, but it's we're renting at, we could we don't have the money stuck to begin with to do the garden and we don't really wanna spend the money to then mm-hmm. get booted out at any time and be like okay can we take the turf that we put down it's just not realistic yeah so it's really difficult when ways. you're renting and you're like spending your money yeah. to like improve their place you know exactly I get it. Yeah. but Absolutely. then you want it to be a nice space so it's like and it's a really bad garden as well because it's like a i don't know if you have them over there but it's like a cottage garden so it's it's an old-fashioned type garden so basically people plant weeds in the garden and then it's kind of like they let it not run wild but it gets quite overgrown and it's one of them where you kind of have to be on it every single day because obviously weeds are not like normal flowers they, they grow more rapidly so basically our entire garden because it was empty for a little while before we moved in has just looked like jumanji <laughs> so it's all weeds. <laughs> you guys you guys over there purposely plant weeds no i don't i don't but some people do to have these like little cottage gardens and it's nice if you're retired and you can go out every day but when you're not retired and you can't go out every day one spell of rain and it's like boom it's up right so like, so, stuff what- like it. so it's like there's a rose in there but it's like a it, it's a rambling rose it's not a rose it's a rambling rose that just goes all around the fucking garden and up underneath the fences and everything <laughs> okay I can't, I can't wrap my head around that because I'm highly allergic to like basically anything that's outside the house. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's hard work. So we've been trying to think of ways that we can make it nice, but it's cost effective. So we, so basically street went outside with some power tools and demolished the entire <laughs> thing pretty much that was out there. And we, I wanted to get some fake, sort of like fake flowers to put on the shed and to put on the gates, just a couple of places. So it's, it, you've got greenery, but it's not high maintenance greenery. So we can just keep going in and sort of like putting everything down. Sure. And yeah. I got all that off Timu and I got um, curtain lights, solar curtain lights, the ones that go all the way around the shed. You know, it has okay. them on like gazebos. Cool. I got those. I got loads of like fake flowers to dangle down, kind of, what you'd have at a wedding over the arch, that kind of style. So you're talking like not tiny things, you're talking quite big ones. Right. Um, and I think I spent in total, like I did get a garden ornament as well, and I think I spent in total for all the stuff about £6. Wow, okay. Yeah, free delivery, £6 for it all. So so what, how do you how do you spell and, this? You call it Timu? Is like T A M O O? No, T E M U. Oh, oh, t- okay, Timu. Like Timu. Got you. Okay. 
a moo moo cow. Well, not really. It's Interesting. Open. Like that was and stupid. It's a website or an app? Like I feel stupid because it sounds like you're telling me everybody oh, is. There's uh, a website and an app. Well, Troy okay. ordered something off it. He ordered a watch off there, and I was like, "Well, if he's ordered a watch off there, yeah, then maybe I should have a look." Interesting. Oh, okay. I'm on the website. I'm doing a little weird spinny thing. I oh, don't get sucked in. Don't get sucked in. You will be at 119 forever. I got a hundred dollar coupon bundle. That's how they get you. I'm clicking it. Scan to download the app. Now they want me to download an app. Yep. This okay. is this is the cycle of how they get you. All right, I'm doing it though. I'm on recommendation, folks at home. I'm doing this on recommendation. Exclusive gift, hundred dollar coupon bundle. I don't know what the hell a coupon bundle means. Oh, uh, it's like if you coupon. order say forty pounds worth of stuff, you get money off. It's like one of them. Spend forty and you get thirty off. It's one of them. Okay. You know where you feel like you're getting more than you actually are? Right. Because you weren't going to spend £30, but because they said you can have £40 off, you go, oh my God, I'll just spend £30. Got it. Okay. Yeah, so it's right. like that. Maybe just X out of all of that so, it lets you, so you can just go and search. No, I got to do the full thing. You got to do the full thing. I tell you what, oh, you are going to be feeding fishes by the end of the day if you carry on. I will not. <laughs> Don't give in. Don't do it. Learn from my mistake. No, I'm not. I'm not going to learn from your mistake. I'm going to make the same mistake because it's fun or ish. Shop now, kids. So I got a hundred dollar coupon bundle. I don't understand it. It's complicated. Twenty five dollars off. Order sixty dollars plus. So okay, so you you spend sixty plus dollars, you get twenty five dollars off. Okay. Uh -huh. Spend eighty plus dollars, you get fifteen dollars off. Well, that's a worse deal. 80 plus 15 off, 80 plus 15 off. Spend $120, get 30 off. Okay. The $25 one sounds like the best deal. So anyway, shop now. Oh, this can't be real. Come on. Are you seeing? What? It's not just, you see, you've not even searched or anything. No, just right up the top, like smartwatches and wireless headphones. What? A pa oh, passport holder. <laughs> I'm like, they're selling passports? <laughs> Of all the stuff on there, I'll take that passport holder. <laughs> no, this is crazy. Really? You received what you were supposed to receive? Yeah, I did, but I am so stingy and skint, so I only picked stuff that was like dirt cheap. And I, mean, I was it all not, seems like and dirt I'm still cheaper. I'm still not willing to risk anything that's that's more. Like I haven't gone for electronics other than the solar lights and some um backlights of the TV. I haven't mm -hmm. gone for anything that's like electrical, so I don't know. Huh. Like I said, I kind of went for like garden stuff and um, a couple of things for the bathroom, you know, like um, like holders and things to hang on the door and stuff, just uh -huh, things like that sure. for storage. Yeah. Oh, folks at home, we're, we're definitely not sponsored by this company, whatever it is, so use at your own risk. Um, Unless they're going to finally <laughs> let get to 100% on the damn fish. <laughs> And the crops. Uh, this is weird. Okay. All right. I'm going to have to look into this a little more later on. That's interesting. I've never heard of it. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. I feel like there's got to be a con, but I can't say that the stuff I ordered. Yeah. I, I would think that it is too. It's a little odd. Yeah. But hey, but we'll find know. out, right? Folks at home, we'll report back. And maybe if you've used it, you can let us know as well. Send us a message on our social or whatever you want to do. Um, we're curious if you had good experiences with Timu. Um, but if anybody's won the damn fish thing. <laughs> if you've won the fish, let us know. <laughs> For God's sake, please let me know whether I should just give up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is funny. I, I've, I've got to find the fish on there now. I don't, maybe I don't I'm want gonna to. Send you, nope, I'm going to send you a link for the fish, damn it. Because then <laughs> I get fish food. Do okay. not find the fish without my link. Oh, I see. So that's how they get new users. The more yes, users you have to. Okay. okay, when you need food. I see, I see. Okay. All right. Well, okay, folks. Uh, we're going to get into the drink of tonight um, after uh, Carly's obsession with feeding her fish is over with. Um, <laughs> and don't forget to let us know if you've used the app and have 
uh, accomplished feeding your fish. <laughs> and, if, and if you've bought any of these ridiculously priced, low priced things and actually received them, or if you've been scammed, we want to know. Um, yeah. So we tonight, could be vigilantes. Yeah, we could. Oh, could what? How? Couldn't we? I don't, I don't know. know. Well, if somebody's not received their stuff, I'll be on Twitter. I'll be on Timu. I'll listen, guys. Oh, digital vigil- vigilantes. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah I can't world. afford to, unless they offered plane tickets on Timu, I can't afford to go down there. But. <laughs> well, now I, I will be you. on. <laughs> <laughs> I will be on Twitter and I'll be like, listen, guys, we have a 10 solid fan base of people. Right. We can all boycott you. Yeah. I'm telling you, I think that's the only thing that. Amazon needs to do is have plane flights and hotels and stuff like that. That would be dangerous. Um, I would get drunk off your stupid drink of the week. I'd end up in fucking God knows where. <laughs> Speaking of, you might end up in Chicago because tonight's drink is called the Chicago. Um, I've never heard of the Chicago and we recently, um, you know, uh, uh, purchased a house out in Illinois um, and Chicago is about three hours away and we have yet to have the time to explore Chicago at all. Um, so I'm interested in wondering if this is a big drink out there or if this is more of like a, a back in the day throwback drink, whatever it is. However, um, the Chicago is a cocktail also sometimes called the fancy brandy cocktail, which I do like brandy. Um, and it's I named after, it. yeah, it's great. And it's named after the windy, windy city, um, which is, you know, it's kind of strange. I guess it must be really windy in Chicago, Marnier, or uh, Contre, Contre, Contre. I'm surprised I got oh, Grand gosh. Marnier. Right? Contre, Contre, <clears throat> uh, a quarter ounce of simple syrup, um, a dash of uh, aromatic bitters, uh, one ounce of champagne, or you could use cava or prosecco, which I don't think you like prosecco, right? You drink champagne? I don't know where it's most in a, in like inopportune time as well. So like at a funeral, I just probably sit there and. of human experience, didn't we? Ladies and gentlemen, we stop this film deliberately to tell you that two of the young people you are watching have just committed what has become the crime of the century. Do you know the strange relationship that existed between them? I do. I think he's a dirty, evil... You keep your filthy mouth shut! Just because he can speak about something besides sex, you and Artie and all the rest of you seem to think he's some kind of freak. You bitching me for some girl? If he tries to rape you, you make excuses for it. This crime is the most fiendish, cold-blooded, inexcusable case the world has ever known. That's what Mr. Horn has told this court. The perpetrators of this crime shall be convicted and hanged. Do you think you can cure it by killing these boys? 
By hanging them, do you think you can cure the hatreds and maladjustments of the world? That was the trailer for the 1959 film Compulsion. And Compulsion is an American crime drama directed by Richard Fleischer. And the film is based on the 1956 novel of the same name by Meyer Levin, um, which was turned, uh, which, sorry, which was a fictionalized account of a murder case that I never heard of before. And I feel like I should have. Um, Yep. I kind of feel like I'm, I'm the only one that's never heard of this. And the. Well, I didn't either. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it's a fictionalized account of the Leopold and Loeb murder trap. Now, I, I feel like fictionalized is. I think this is almost a time where it's almost the opposite of when you watch like a. Um, a, a, a based on a true story movie where there's so much inaccuracy and so many embellished things that when I went and I read about the actual murder trial, I felt like there was almost everything that I read as far as the murder, uh, you know, the crime went was damn accurate in the movie. And so I found that to be fascinating personally. So then I did this whole deep dive into the murder trial and whatnot, but we'll get into that later. And before we do, um, this, uh, cast is, I, I really enjoyed the cast personally for this movie, but, um, it sort of stars Orson Welles in half the film, even though he has top billing, um, which I guess makes sense because it's Orson Welles. Um, but also Diane, uh, Varsi, who I don't know her except for, for this film, but she looked extremely familiar. Um, but I did not recognize anything that I had seen when I, I looked her up. Um, and then the um, amazing Dean Stockwell, whom I love. I think he's just a fantastic actor. Um, and Bradford Dillman, who I think did a fantastic job as R.D. Strauss. Um, but before we get too much further, we're going to uh, dive into Carly's uh, In a Nutshell synopsis. And now it's time for Carly's super famous In a Nutshell synopsis. Okay, so I'm going to do my synopsis, and then I'm going to explain it after you go, what? <laughs> okay. Okay. It's always so, a treat. Yeah, well, there you go. You're welcome. So the synopsis I came up with was, it's like Depp v. Heard, free social media influences. Oh, oh say that again? <laughs> it's like Depp v. Heard, oh. free social media influences. Uh, oh, okay, okay, oh, okay. And the re- the reason why is because I just I could just envision this being live streamed on Law and Order, and the mob mentality of the human race having like like Awesome Wells's little like mob, then the other mob, and it just being a mob off. Yeah, I mean. So I- there we go. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I totally, I, I get that too, because there is like this weird um, romance between these two, which isn't like, you know, in the film, it's not like a sexual romance or anything, but there is yeah, this. It's kind of hinted at through like subtle little ways, isn't it? Yeah. I almost felt like the movie itself, and maybe it's because of, um, uh, what do you call it? like the ratings board back at the time that they couldn't um, or didn't want to yes. get into that sort of thing. I'm not really certain. Um, however, I felt like there was such a respect between uh, these two characters, Steiner and Strauss in the film who would be Leopold and Loeb respectively. Um, 
that in the film it's portrayed in such a way that I thought was really well done considering their motives for what they've done. And before I guess we get into the film, I do want to go through the true story. So people at home kind of know what we're talking about in case they're like me and you and had no idea what low Leopold and Loeb trial was about. Yeah, I think Um, that's fair. So, so these, these two boys, uh, who are becoming men, they're about 18 and 19, I believe when this happened, come from very affluent, um, families in the Chicago area. Um, and they knew each other cause they lived down the street from each other, but they didn't really become friends or, um, you know, uh, really hang out until they started going to college. And when they started going to college, they became very close and they both have ex- very high IQs. Um, and they're very intelligent and they, um, I think it was Leopold was very into, uh, neat, uh, what, how do you pronounce his name? Nishi, niche, niche. Um, anyway, and there's Talk this, involved. yeah, there's this concept, uh, that he had about, um, there being intellectual, um, superior humans, um, that he called supermen, which is all about m- m- being superman mentally, right? Not flying through the air and being super strong, but, um, uh, people of this world who are just superior to most others um, in the world because they're f- far superior mentally, smarter, higher IQs. That yeah, sort of it's thing. like superior intellect, isn't it? Uh-huh. Like- right. Um, and so these two boys, and I call them boys because they very much act like boys, no matter how smart they are. Um, they uh they felt that they were of this superior intellect and the really interesting thing about these two is that i don't think that they're really set out necessarily to be murderers or to do what they did per se but they wanted to try to find a way to prove i think more to themselves really than the outside world that they were superior and so they came up with kind of do a perfect murder yeah they came up with this concept to do a perfect murder and that would somehow prove to themselves that they were of superior intellect and the second interesting thing is that how poorly that went for them um for for all intents and purposes what they were trying to do they seem to have botched everything they could have um, so I, I'm not sure if that's a, <laughs> what, what that really says about their intellect. Maybe they're too blinded by how smart they were to actually, um, be able to implement the plan properly. I'm not sure, but however, they came up with a plan to kidnap a young boy and apparently it took them, uh, seven months to come up with their full on plan. and then implement it um so they decided on strangely enough i think it was leopold's uh second cousin whom lived across the street from him um who was 14 years old they decided they were going to kidnap him um which they did one day after school uh they were driving in the the car and they saw him walking and they talked him to get into the car when there was he was only two blocks away from his house, which is really strange. Anyway, so their plan was to kidnap the boy and then murder him, but then to take um, eyes off the investigation or whatever it was to set up a fake ransom. Um, And almost immediately when they did this, the body was found. Um, So the ransom scenario only lasted for like a day or two 
And, and even with the ransom scenario was kind of botched because it was a little too complicated because the people who were supposed to take the ransom there forgot the address to even take it to. And then while that's happening, somebody finds the body of the little boy. So then they know that the ransom is, you know, you know, not real. Like there's no reason to give the ransom because the boy's dead. Um, and then I, I, Leopold, I think it was dropped his glasses at the crime scene. And it's not like it's some, uh, untraceable, you know, common set of glasses. Well, actually the glasses were, but it had a very expensive and, um, new type of hinge on the, uh, on the glasses. Um, so only three people in Chicago had purchased them. So it was very easy for the police to trace it back to, to him. Um, so almost every step of the way of this whole process was just messed up for these kids. <laughs> um, it's kind of like the privilege dump them in it. Like the privilege was everyone doing. Sure. They, yeah. Because they don't live in the real world. They don't realize that there's only three people that are that privilege to have that type of glasses like every other person in right. chicago is just on the bread line just getting what they can yeah and i mean how do you i mean just the idea of even dropping them is like crazy but you know and then one of them is going around my glasses right and not- if we were doing a bank robbery my glasses were on the floor in the bank i'd have to send you back in because if i'm the get ready driver we're not going anywhere mate I can't even see. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, you would have thought he might have went back for them or something. I don't really know. It's like it was crazy. Or maybe they wanted to get caught. Or maybe they left them on purpose because they never thought that they could possibly trace them back because they were being that smart. I really don't know. Um, however, it didn't work out for them. And one of them was going around actively trying to help the cops solve the murder because the cops are at the college that they're going to and yeah, yeah well, people, people always think that's a clever idea to get yourself on the good side of the police and be helpful you don't realize it just puts you on their radar yeah no it wasn't wasn't helpful at all and all of these pieces of the true story all are in the film and that's one of the reasons where i really feel like it's very non-fictionalized I, I, you know maybe some of the interactions between the two and their friends might be fictionalized. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe, maybe they, because they embellish conversations that they thought that they had, maybe that's it. Maybe, but the the actual crime and the way it plays out is all very real up to Orson Welles' um, monologue in the courtroom. It's all like verbatim from what happened. So, but wasn't that exceptional? Sure, yeah. And, 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 and he, do you know what he reminded me of? He reminded me of like a Perry Mason who can't be bothered oh, yes. and needs yeah. a drug fix. Like yeah. genuinely. I mean, it totally Not did. in like, a bad way. No. Not no. in a horrible way. Like, I don't mean that as an insult, but I was like, oh my God, this is like Perry Mason towards the end of his life when he just doesn't care anymore. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's exactly what I was thinking too. And I was watching, I was like, man, Orson Welles would have been a great Perry Mason. <laughs> you know? but, See what um, I'm- yeah. Um, but th- that's, so that's the backstory for this movie. Um, and it's a really interesting murder case just because these two people and, and what they've done and why they did it. And I, I don't think that they ever really wanted to be murderers. I don't think it was like something like they're demented in a certain way where they're just inherently killers and wanting to kill people. It's a, it's like a motivation on a completely different level that, you know, is just so strange, I think, and foreign to people. Yeah. And like murder was the outcome. Like mm-hmm, it was kind yeah. of like an experiment and one of the variables was right. murder. That's why they were so calm yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Loeb went on to be murdered in prison by some, uh, by an inmate whom, so this is where like the, the, um, the sort of relationship between Leopold and Loeb sort of like, I I'm not certain. And, and there's no certain information out there as to whether they were uh, like intimately involved or if they were just really close friends, because when Loeb was murdered in prison, it's um, it's a little convoluted because the person that murdered him, you know, said that Loeb came on to him 
And so he killed him. But then there's people in the prison system who, uh, I guess, had witnessed it and said that uh, that the murderer came on to Loeb and Loeb rejected him. And that's why he killed him. Um, oh. So I'm not certain. And, and Leopold has, you know, said that there was no relationship between the two in that way and that uh, Loeb was not gay and and would never have done something like that and there's nobody else in their families or um friend groups that implied um that they were gay or um they have actually said that they don't they do not believe that they were um but there is this whole thing surrounding them where there there are certain people that felt that they were um you know which, the thing is though it's it's very hard i think for men to have that kind of intense friendship so i think i do think it's very sexist in the way that if i had a best friend who was a woman and you know we would i don't know come over for a movie night and we'll sleep in the same bed and watch a film and fall asleep and in the morning you know you wouldn't think twice about oh just, i'm just gonna get changed or something it, there's less inhibitions there mm-hmm. and people would just go oh that's just what girls are like and i think it's really hard for men to have that kind of relationship because other men potentially judge, and even women as well. Even women are like, oh, well, no. But if women can have that, then why can't men have that? And I think maybe that's something that even now people still struggle with a little bit. So back then, imagine what that was like. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. I think part of that is because uh, the way men perceive that women judge them and, and so that's they, why men don't talk. They always say men don't yeah. talk to each other sometimes, do they? And that's probably rooted in why. Right. And I think that's what it is. It's not necessarily women judge men that way, but I think they perceive women judge them that way. So they judge each other that way. And then yeah. as such, I think women see that. And so sometimes they say things judgmentally because they know that they're going to be able to affect them that way. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like it's like a weird yeah. vicious cycle no, it is. And <laughs> of I think insecurity. Even if, even if you're having banter and you're having a joke, mm-hmm. I think sometimes if I, if I made a bantery joke to you, mm-hmm. I might think, Oh, it's just, that's just what I say to anybody. But you may take that completely differently and go, right. Because it's come from me and go, Oh, okay. And then it will impact your sort of future behaviors. Mm-hmm. But then, yeah. If you don't say anything and I continue with, you know, oh, it's fine. We're having a laugh. Mm-hmm. It's, it's one of them, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think you, I think you have that right. I think that's what it is. And, and for these two, I think you're right. I think it, maybe they were just really close in that way because they found another person that was very similar to themselves, even though there's an interesting dynamic between the two um, where one of them was more social and athletic and the other one was very more of a recluse and you know loner type um so i think that that was also an aspect that uh, they fed off of each other and that was another thing i think that they did really well in the movie to play that a tribute between uh dean stockwell and, and bradford dillman i think they really uh pulled it off extremely well um so you know anyway really, really yeah, funny i uh-huh. was watching i was watching it in the first like three minutes and he went, oh my God, this guy reminds me of Dean Stockwell so much. Because I don't, when I watch a film for the podcast, I don't research it. If I've never seen it before, I don't research it at all. I just watch it. And then I, I look into it a bit more. Uh-huh. And I was watching it. God, that bloke looks like Dean Stockwell. But he doesn't half look like Dean Stockwell. Street, this bloke looks like Dean Stockwell. And then I've got Street going, who's, who's that? Stargate, love. Remember the episode of Stargate I made you watch? You said that, love. Quantum Leap, you didn't like that, but I made you watch it. And he's going, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, that is Dean Stockwell. Okay, hold on a second. He doesn't like Quantum Leap? No, he likes Red Dwarf. I like Red Dwarf too, but you know what? Street, you're fired. No, he's, yeah, no, he's he's not. A, do you know what? I'm amazed that he likes Red Dwarf because he is not a sci-fi dude. At, oh, no. I've told okay. you before, haven't I? When I give him my, my sci-fi scripts to read, yeah. because I obviously think I'm fantastic at sci-fi and I'm not. I don't because know. Because I just that. overcomplicate stuff. <laughs> assuming that everybody's watching the Enterprise and fucking Star Trek and knows what I'm on about. So I'll give him a sci-fi script to read and he'll just, on page one, halfway down, and go, what the hell is this? What does this even mean? And he just throws it on the floor going, 
don't understand. Get it away from me. <laughs> he could be awkward. And he's like, I'll use it as a coaster. I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, you know, to each their own, I guess. <laughs> he's in a great episode of Columbo, too. Um, I just think he's a great oh. actor. Yeah, I like it. I like him a lot. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. So this movie uh, is, you know, interesting for a lot of those reasons. Also for Orson Welles being in it and getting top billing over uh, both the actual stars. Um, uh, oh, it's like how, a Marley Brando apocalypse now style, isn't it? Kind of. And you know, it's funny because he kind of looked like Marlon Brando uh, in that time frame of apocalypse. I mean, oh, like, he just, he sort of like he's gaining weight and like all that kind of stuff. Like it really, sort of, I was feeling that. And um, this, this movie came right after um, Wells did touch of evil where apparently oh. uh, it wasn't re- very well received out in America. And so, he, Wells is very bitter about it, um, and he wanted to actually direct Compulsion, but they wouldn't let him because of Touch of Evil. So what? They, if Orson yeah. Wells says he wants to direct your film, you go, "Here you go, love." There's the camera. Yeah, there was a time where that would have been a thing, but um, yeah, I mean, as quickly as he was in the graces of Hollywood, he fell out as well and had, I mean, it's very well known as tumultuous kind of experience with, with Hollywood. Um, and this was one of them. Um, so his time on set was apparently, um, very, um, combative. Um, and he threw a lot of tantrums and was just difficult to work with. Um, but it's crazy because he did such an amazing job, like as as a lawyer. Yeah. Um, and um, so so for this movie to get made, um, is kind of interesting to me because the author of the book went to Leopold, and this is kind of right after I think, or a year or two after uh, Loeb was murdered. Um. And he asked uh, Leopold if he could write a book, um, you know, based on, you know, what happened. And Leopold turned him down. He didn't, he did not want a fictionalized account. And I think this has to do with like their sort of Superman complex, right? Like the disclaimer as well, the film. It could be. Yeah. Because he didn't give permission. Right. And that's the reason why they changed the names um, in the film as well. but uh, he he instead offered uh, Levin a job to write his memoir with him, which Levin did not want to do. Um, and went ahead and wrote his version of the story um, and titled it Compulsion, which became the film. And again, it's like it's a it's an enigma to me because to me it's it's so right on to what actually happened that um you know i just i'm surprised well actually he did get sued leopold did eventually sue him for some sort of like defamation kind of thing but the supreme court in chicago or illinois um uh what did they say? They said uh, the court ruled against him, noting that Leopold, as the confessed perpetrator, because he did confess to the crime, like when they arrested them, they eventually, just like in the film, they eventually confessed. Uh, because he confessed, was the confessed perpetrator of the crime of the century, which it was dubbed, uh, could not reasonably demonstrate that Levin's book had damaged his reputation, because obviously his reputation is already damaged as a murderer, right? Um, so well, I thought yeah. that was pretty, pretty fascinating. Um, so, uh, the movie went on to win several awards. Uh, it won, uh, it was an, or sorry, it was nominated for several awards. Um, it was nominated for a BAFTA, uh, best picture. Uh, it was nominated for best director by the, uh, director's guild. It was nominated for best screenplay by writer's guild and Dean Stockwell, Bradford Dillman and Orson Welles were nominated um, for uh, Best Actor at the Cannes Film Festival. Um, and all three of them, which is, again, another interesting sort of thing, won for Best Actor. Um, and I didn't wow. know that that was a thing. Like, you know, I, to me, yeah, I thought it would be either one or other. Did they make all three of them. 
Yeah, they're all three of them. Yeah, but who well, gets to take it home? Do they? Do they make two more of them? It must have. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not certain, but I, I mean, I think that's what the academy does when multiple people on a team. But um, yeah, because I'd that's, be fuming. I'd be like, listen, I'm having a piece of this. We're going to chop it up. I'm having the edge. You're having that. Like, mm-hmm. if you're not making me another one, I am having a piece. <laughs> right. Um. But uh, yeah, and, and the, the film itself was very well received among critics and um, audience members, um, and it still currently holds an, a, a critic's approval rating of 100% of Rotten Tomatoes, which I personally don't care for Rotten Tomatoes, but if it's the current standard since you know the early 2000s, it is what it is. Um, so yeah, um, I, I just, I feel like if you know the case, that this movie is based on, you know, the movie. Um, and, and so it's, it's hard to like separate the two, honestly, because to me, it's really a autobiography, <laughs> you know, kind of film. Um, yeah. How, however, I found it interesting that I'm, I'm, I really love, it's one of my favorite Hitchcock films, but the film rope apparently is also based off of this story or this concept. And, and I didn't know that. And after watching compulsion, and reading about the case and thinking about rope, I'm like, oh my God, yeah, it, this is so, this is so this. And, and it's, it's amazing because it's a completely different kind of film uh, taking place in one room and it's brilliantly directed. Um, but yeah, the, the whole dynamic and the idea behind it is, is it's the same story. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. And then I found, um, uh, what is it called? Murder by Numbers? Sandra Bullock movie yes. is also based yeah, yeah. on the same thing. Yeah. Wow. Um, which I remember liking when I first saw that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess, um, I don't know. This is a tough one for me because we already went over the murder case and all that, which is the same as the movie. Um, but I guess, uh, what's your favorite part of the movie? Like how, what, how did it hit you when you were watching it? No, oh, see, I don't, this is really hard for me because I'll be honest, to begin with, I was so bored and I thought, oh my God, I'm really not going to like this. And then all of a sudden it kicked into gear and I was like, oh God. And it started, the thing that I like about this film is it really got me thinking for at the time while I was watching it and for days afterwards. And I have the attention span of a gnat, like I really don't get. Um, I could watch murder documentaries all day and not even bat an eyelid. And I was like, it started reminding me of things. And I was like, start, it, it got me questioning the monologue at the end, got me questioning my ideas of kind of like capital punishment and things like that. When he was doing the whole, oh, it's I'm pleading for the future and all this kind of thing. And it made me think that line in itself made me think about a particular case in the UK, which I don't know if you've heard of or not, but it was the Jamie Bulger case. I have not heard about it now. Where two boys, um, two young schoolboys, not 14, younger. So you're talking like um, 11, 12, something like that. They took this little toddler off and they killed him. And because, um, well, they killed, they did awful things, but they killed him as well. Um, And there was a big hoopla at at the time, very similar to this. There was a lot of people saying like, they should be tried as adults for what they've done. They should be thrown in prison. This should happen. That should happen. And obviously we don't have death penalty over here, but if they'd have gone into an adult prison, I mean, God knows. And then there was the other side of the camp that were like, no, they're children. They don't know what they're doing. And they ended up, um, it came very close to the wire, but they ended up doing uh, trial and putting them on trial, sorry, as juveniles, not adults. Okay. So they went through the juvenile system and it was kind of this whole idea of pleading for the future and rehabilitation over blame and that kind of thing. Um, one of them, when they were released, it's all, it's all very hush hush because obviously they've got different names and they, you know, they went into witness protection and things like that when they came out because it was a massive uproar. Right. Um, one of them came out and apparently for all intents and purposes has a new life may have a family, like, it's completely different. The other one, however, as soon as he came out, he just fell into the same pattern. Huh. And it it took, um, I recall watching a documentary on it where this crime had occurred 
and then they eventually found out because they could they couldn't trace his history because obviously when you go into witness protection for example you do have a backstory and you have all these sort of things but there comes a point where there isn't any right you get yeah. shut down mm-hmm. and they ended up discovering that that was him so he then got in you know put in prison and, and whatever under the next assumed name he came out again he did the same thing not murder but he did a very you know very awful thing again went back in prison and he just is trapped in that cycle of just doing it. And he was kind of like the lead, the one that was pushing it. Huh. Whereas the other one kind of went along. And it got really got me thinking to, well, <laughs> if there had been a punishment sort of issue, you've got on the one side, there are potentially kids and a family that wouldn't, be here now and having the life that they had if they'd have been hung for example but then on the other side of the coin you've got this other person where if he had been hung there would have been a lot of other people that wouldn't have been hurt so it's a really it really um sparked quite an interesting debate to be honest no that makes a lot of sense and that's actually uh kind of similar to these guys because although uh Loeb was murdered uh, Leopold ended up um, getting paroled in 58, 1958. Um, so he didn't obviously did not spend his life in prison, but he went on to do a lot of, you know, pretty significant things. Wow. Um, working in the medical field and also contributing to, I can't remember what it's called, but something about um, studying of birds or whatnot. Cause they were, he was an avid bird watcher. Um, and there's some significant things that he had ended up doing in his life. Never, um, as far as I could find falling back on any sort of criminal activity. Um, so it is, it is pretty interesting. And that, that just to me furthers the case of, you know, well, these guys weren't really murderers. They just murdered somebody. Right. Um, and it's sad, a 14 year old kid, um, you know, is that they even had to do any of this. They're obviously terrible, terrible people. Um, but man, humans are complicated, weird beings, you know, very crazy. Yeah. I, um, yeah, it's really strange. Um, no, I, I've never heard of that case that you're talking about. Um, I, yeah, it's re- awful. It's, it's awful. It is, I feel like we need to do a true crime awful. podcast. <laughs> it sounds awful. If I can, if I say, if you can stomach it, then it's worth looking into, but it is off. I watch a lot of crew crime and uh, sorry, true crime and, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. I like yeah. watching the police aspect of it and, and how their how serial killers minds tick and stuff like that. Yeah. And even I can't, I struggle to watch documentaries about that because it's just awful. Because mm-hmm. I just, I, th- I look at Lily and think, oh my God, what if her and a mate? It's like oh, yeah, her and yeah. a friend walking off with somebody. What? I'm the same it's way. My family gets so annoyed like, at me awful. for being paranoid. <laughs> like it, it really is. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah, it's it's awful. And to think that too, like you always think about adults being evil and doing evil things. Yeah. And I think when you've got like a, an 11 year old, like you know, kids can be mean. They can they can be really mean because they don't understand what they're saying and the implications of what they're saying. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of a bit like that. It's almost like physical work. Like maybe they don't understand the ramifications of what they've done and this was before kind of video games and stuff like that so it's not even like you could blame playstations and (laughs) grand theft and all that kind of crap that's why i disagree with that yeah um because you know what i mean i lived through two children doing that before they had access to a playstation right so i don't know it's just it's just Ah, I don't know. It really, but this film really like sparked that, and that's just what I thought about. Even though it's a little similar, um, yeah, it left the mark after yeah, watching definitely. it. Definitely. All right. Well, it's, speaking of, why don't we get into your rating for it then? Because um, I'm I'm curious where where you land. Hmm. See, I I actually I was going to give it a ten, but. Okay. I did feel that I was emotionally connecting to the story more after a certain point because I did. I do have to be honest and say I did find the setup very, very monotonous and very, very boring. Mm. And it's sad because maybe people would have turned off to begin with. 
Because if we weren't watching, if we weren't watching it for the podcast, and I was just watching it on TV, I would have changed channel, and then oh. I would have missed out on the the essence of it. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Interesting. But yeah. I don't necessarily think that there was a, with this particular story. I don't necessarily think there was a different filmmaking point of view. You know, you couldn't have thrown in with a flashback and then got well. Maybe you could have, but I don't necessarily think it would have had the same impact towards the end of the film so I'd go in oh yeah it was great and then it got boring mm-hmm. um, so I settled on a nine okay and I feel no, quite I, bad taking a point away but I'll no I think nine. that I think that makes total sense because I'm kind of in the same boat with you um, for different slightly different reasons um, I didn't find the beginning boring per se However, I did not like that there wasn't very much backstory. Like I would have liked to have seen a bit of their family dynamic in the beginning. Like how are they? Context. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, how does their family treat them? How are is their dynamic within the family before the scene that we get with um with Dean Sockwell's character coming home and I think his brother? bitching and complaining at him and talking about the father. Like it was all just sort of like just pops up. There was no, I mean, you get the concept, you get what's happening and all that kind of stuff. It's not that you don't understand, but it just didn't feel um, comfortable. Like, you know, we didn't, we didn't get an introduction to this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There was no kind of like flow at the beginning. I felt right. And and that's my, this is the person, this is the situation. This is, what happens yeah. yeah absolutely so that's my only real issue with it was just the beginning like maybe 15 20 minutes something like that just kind of jumping into the story that way and having to kind of know like i didn't care about these guys and what's going on at all at that point because i didn't know what i was watching you know no exactly if, if the I, same i felt exactly the same yeah if i had read about if i knew it was about the leopold loeb case and i had read about it and i knew about that case or something like that i might have been more interested in the beginning it would have made more sense to me i suppose and maybe that was why they did it because everybody at that time probably knew about it um and maybe that makes sense but as like looking back at it now um not knowing anything about it what was going on um, I think that's really what I'm missing. And that's the reason why I also give it a nine, just because that, that, that opening setup was not what I felt it should have been for as good as the movie is. Like yes. I, I felt yeah. like that was the only real failure there. Cause I, I loved the acting, the directing, the story, even whatever might be made up in there. Um, the, the Script courtroom drama. Yeah. It was just, it's really yeah. well done. Um, and executed and, and except for that beginning, you know, uh, uh, but Hey, again, a different time that it was made. It very well just could be because everybody knew the case. Maybe it would have been too mundane to go that route. I don't know. But in today's world, not knowing anything about it, that was my, my big issue. So also a nine. So two nines, did also 99 like as well. I really liked as well how the coroner reminds me of every CSI coroner <laughs> in all the series. Like that is, a, I don't, I will argue with anybody until the end of time. They've watched this film and they've gone, <laughs> that's our coroner character. 100% they have. It's just like, all he needed was to be eating a, he, all he needed was to be eating a salami sandwich while he's like, you know, yes, muscles. also, <laughs> yes, <laughs> or wobbling around on a stick. You're like, that's it. <laughs> that's it <laughs> yeah but overall i think it's a great film I, I think it's it's super enjoyable i would definitely watch it again i think uh it's a really creepy fascinating uh case uh based on real life and it's one of those things you just can't make up because it's just so ridiculously crazy um do you not think it's weird how um obviously we we both have a bit of an interest in true crime and stuff like that and between us we've still never come across anything that's covered this other, yeah, other I do than this film yeah I think that is super interesting I don't know why um, you know especially there being several movies based on it several books like there's oh even a they're saying even a Columbo episode is based off of the story um, yeah so it's like I don't I don't know why 
I have no idea why. I've it's never like everybody's this. loosely tapped into it, but not actually explored it. Right. Yeah. I guess maybe because they're trying to make it their own idea. You know, because I don't recall any of those other movies having, you know, saying anything like based on this or, you know. No. So it's like. But then it, there's no, there's no true, like, there's not even a true crime podcast that I'm aware of. I mean, there probably is out there somewhere, but nothing that I personally come across. I haven't come across even, it either. Yeah. I, and, and there's got to be, there have to be, right? <laughs> you would think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But that's why I say we, we, I think we should, we need to, we need to do a true crime podcast. I don't know what. Oh, don't, because I would love that. Yeah. I mean, I would buy 27 new locks of the front door after (laughs) every episode. (laughs) It'd be like Alcatraz in my house, but. (laughs) I feel like I'm not a good enough storyteller or a good enough detective to actually do that and pull it off and make it interesting or or different than what's already out there. So that'd be my only it's so oversaturated it would just purely be for our own sort of enjoyment I don't necessarily think anybody else would enjoy it because <laughs> we have nothing new to bring to the table maybe we'll maybe we need to like do a pilot episode and see how it turns out kind of like how we did for this show where we did um, um conflict was it conflict wasn't it or the movie yeah it was conflict conflict right okay Wait, which case would you pick though that's the question it'd take us two years to pick one that's true maybe <laughs> We should do this one. I don't know. Now I feel like we just did it. Oh, here we go. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe. Well, what's your suggestion? I, I don't. I'm not certain, honestly. I, I think well, you know, honestly, I think I think if I was going to do a true crime podcast, I think the first episode would need to be a setup of what is crime, what is what is considered. Uh, oh, this, the this FBI thing. filing cabinets. Kind of, you know. I mean, I, I, I just feel like that a lot of these shows just tell this story, but they don't really delve into anything psychological, like nature versus nurture, or, um, you know, like this sort of like how has society progressed and how has crime, how is crime a part of it, and those sorts of things. I feel like. If I was to do something, that would be the first episode to sort of backstory of what crime. I know we all know what crime is or, or murder is, but I feel like a sort of historical exploration of it would be a good starting point. And then sort of. Uh, just, I'm just calling it right now. You yeah. can do the research for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> no, I'm not doing work here. <laughs> I just want to talk nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Anyway. <laughs> and that would probably be boring as hell. <laughs> Maybe that's why we shouldn't do it. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, that was tonight's film, Compulsion. And uh, you should watch it along with the, having a sip on the Chicago. Because um, this uh, wonderful film does take place in the windy city of Chicago, Illinois. And uh, I do hope that you find the time to watch it. And, uh, you know, if you do, let us know what you think. And uh, try not to uh, try not to murder anybody, guys. All right. Until next time. Bye-bye. He's looking at you, kid. Thanks for joining us this week on the Speakeasy Noir Cast. Make sure to visit our website, resurrectionfilms.net, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or any of your favorite podcast apps so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like the show, you might want to check out our book, The Dark Side of Acting Up and The Dark Side of Acting Up Volume 2, now available on Amazon. Or you can check out one of our films, also available on Amazon Prime. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the Speakeasy Noir Cast.